Let's pray together for the persecuted church. And then I'll bring you up to date on a couple of other things that relate to persecution, some things that you need to be aware of otherwise, and then we'll open the Bible together. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the privilege that you have given to each one of us to be here in this room. We recognize that there are others that are watching online, listening on the radio, that will be listening to this service later in the recorded archives. But Lord, together we make up a body of people that are seeking you and are privileged with the freedom to listen to the Bible studies, to gather our hearts together. And Today in particular, I'm very thankful for those that have gathered themselves in this room. We know some cannot be here for various reasons, but those that are here, Lord, have come in because they're hungry for you. They're hungry for a time where we can corporately worship together and where we can see one another and encourage one another. Your word is so clear that we should exhort one another and that we should not forsake gathering together. And all the more as the day approaches, we recognize in that in exhortation that there is a habit that some people get engaged in of neglecting the corporate fellowship. And again, I thank you, Lord, for those that are here for that reason. Lord, I thank you so much that you have given us the freedom to be able to be here and to pray. We recognize not only are there people all over the world outside of America that are persecuted, thinking about the thousands and thousands of people that lost their lives in Nigeria, just being one state in Africa. We know that there are people in states and countries all over the world that their lives literally are threatened by public gatherings, by an expression of faith in you, by a public declaration of the gospel. And Lord, we pray for them. We're privileged to be able to come together and pray like this. And we take advantage of it by coming together and by seeking your face on behalf of others. Lord, you tell us in your word that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and that your ears are open unto our prayers. And so, Lord, we do pray for the persecuted church. We pray for those that are suffering. We pray for those that are in prison for their faith. We pray for those that have survived and have lost loved ones to penalties that cost them their earthly lives. And those that still survive in this world without those that they love. We pray for comfort upon them and strength for them and that you would embolden their faith. Lord, that the, the blood that has been shed by martyrs would inspire the living saints to be all that much more diligent in their prayers, in their study, in their declaration, in the hope that they provide others around them. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for the boldness of your people and the willingness to be persecuted for your name's sake. And Lord, let it be only for the truth that we are persecuted, not because of personality or because of certain non-eternal issues. But let us be willing to stand strong on those things that your word declares to us. Use us, we pray, and our fellow brothers and sisters around the globe for your glory. Bless John and Carol as they continue this ministry on our behalf. And bless Pastor X and his wife and family in Pakistan and those that they're serving. We do pray, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit upon those gypsies, that they would not be waffling back and forth between Islam and Christianity, but that they would understand the truth and that the truth would set them free, even if it means the cost of their temporal and earthly lives. We know, Lord, to be absent from the body is to be present with you, and so we would have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Knowing that you have a purpose and a plan for all of our lives, Lord, there is a time in which we will stay here, for it is more needful, as your word tells us, that we are here to serve others. 
So we do serve, we give of our time, our resources, and Lord, we do that until the day you come or call us home. We thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this week, if you were here on Wednesday night, you will remember that I played a short video for you from Pastor Rob McCoy. Pastor Rob is the pastor of a church in Thousand Oaks, California. Uh, the church is called God Speak, Calvary Chapel. And um, Pastor Rob is being persecuted by opening their church. You have heard already about the activities surrounding John MacArthur and the court cases there, uh, decisions in his favor and then against him. And now we're continuing to see drama there. Uh, one judge overturned another in that context. But Pastor Rob lives in a community where he was the mayor of Thousand Oaks and the pastor of a church of about 400 people. And during the process of the governor shutdown and then their county commissioners making the mandate uh, noted to their community, he and all the other churches of Thousand Oaks were commanded to shut down their buildings. We already know that churches can't sing in California. Uh, all the more reason you should sing louder than you've ever sang. We sing on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Amen. Go ahead. But uh, the churches have been not only now forbidden to uh, sing, but in some counties, churches are closed. Well, Pastor Rob said no. He said this is, this is what we're supposed to be doing. The Bible commands us to gather together. Now, recognize that in the front end of the COVID-19, not knowing exactly what we were dealing with, churches all over the country and around the world closed down temporarily on behalf of those that might otherwise get very, very sick. But since that time, we have learned that COVID is barely, if any, worse than the average flu. And we've never shut down the world for the flu. And so we are commanded by the Lord to gather together. Forsake not the assembling together of yourselves as the manner of some is. That means we come into buildings and places of worship and we will gather our hearts together and we will not neglect to do so. Well, Pastor Rob was prosecuted, and uh, in the court that he was uh, heard, where he was heard, the judge told his attorney, make sure that Pastor Rob knows what the second commandment is uh, related to the loving of your neighbor. And I think the judge, trying to do the best he could with the situation and the political climate and the tension uh, was encouraging the attorney to tell Pastor Rob McCoy, love your neighbor. Well, Pastor Rob responded with, you're darn right I'll love my neighbor. We're going to open it up because there's people out there that are hurting. They need to have a place of refuge. They need to have a place of worship. Businesses need to open up. Businesses are going out of business. He said over 60% of the restaurants in that area are closing down permanently. Uh, that, that, we, we might think to ourselves, well, okay, who cares? A business closes down. We don't care about that. But wait a minute. What about the owner of that business? What about the employees of that business? What about the fact that people are losing their houses and they're losing their, their livelihood? They don't even have enough money for food, oftentimes in car, insurance, gasoline, transportation, whatever is necessary for them because our governors are shutting down our states. It needs to stop. It needs to stop completely. It's wrong. This is stupid. Okay, now don't get excited. So, nigga. <laughs> he was here the other day, huh? So, Pastor Rob said, no, we're not going to do it. And so, um, he had to go to court. And some, some people here at the church kept telling me, you got to talk to uh, Pastor Rob. You guys are like brothers from another mother. And I, I didn't know him. And uh, I thought to myself, you know what? The guy's a busy guy. He doesn't have time to take a call from a perfect stranger. He doesn't know anything about me or candlelight. But I kept getting needled about it. And, and so I finally decided, well, what the heck? I'll call him. So I called. Turns out we spent a half an hour on the phone together. We prayed together. We wept together. He needed the encouragement. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. 
People all over this country have got to be knocking down your door trying to get to you. And he said, no, he goes, you, you have no idea how important this phone call is to me. And I said, well, look, if you want to be pestered by me, I'll pester you. But uh, I don't want to I don't want to be the, the kind of guy that's just uh, another one of those nuisance phone calls. And I said, but if you feel like it and you, after the court case on Friday, which is two days ago, if you want to give me a call, give me an update on what happened. Lo and behold, after the court case, he called me. And, you know, man, every news station's out there wanting to get a story. The newspapers are wanting to get a story. He's busy doing his, his program, pastoring his church, which, by the way, I might mention to you, grew from 400 to 2,000 through this process. And why? And why is that? Because the people there can't go to church. The people there don't have opportunity to have their freedoms, and so they're hungering for the Lord. Now, that bugs me a little, because in our community, we get to go to church, and we don't care. We just want to go boating. We want to go out and get a new jet ski, or we're going to go camping or whatever. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with all of that. But man, our churches, every one of our churches ought to be packed full of Christians seeking the Lord and praying and asking God to put a spirit of repentance on this land, because what we're dealing with is not a virus. It's demonic. What we're dealing with here is an, a, a political agenda, and it's not about politicians. This is a demonic spirit that is trying to affect what we have enjoyed in this country that has allowed us the opportunity to worship so that we can gather together, so that we can give our finances, so that we can support missionaries and missions all over the world and support the persecuted church. And we need to more than we've ever before gather together in our buildings more than we've ever before worshiped with the top of our lungs Don't. i'm not i wasn't waiting for that i was actually but i'm glad you're excited about that see but i'm i'm preaching to the choir because you're here California's here, right there. Amen. Hey, so you want to hear something? This morning, first service, after the service is over, guy and his wife come up and talk to me, and they said, man, bro, thank you so much for talking about our pastor. I said, what do you mean, your pastor? And they said, yeah, we go to Rob McCoy's church. We came up here to visit. We're thinking of relocating to Coeur d'Alene, and we just happened to come to Candlelight. And here we are talking about his pastor up here. And so Rob McCoy calls me on the phone and he tells me what's happened. And he said, yep, we were found guilty of contempt of court. And they charged us six counts of contempt for meeting together and for every service. So we, we've met two Sundays in a row since the, uh, the order to shut down our church. I mean, they, they, these guys, it was amazing, the stuff. The police were going to be called, the sheriff's department. I mean, they're, they're going to they're gonna start siding people out in the yard as they're coming to church or coming into the church. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, they're going to hurt people, you know? Gathering together to worship our holy God that is the healer of the sick? We're afraid of a virus? Come on. Now, I recognize that people that have propensities to, to sickness or the aged or those that are, have uh, comorbidity issues. We, we're sensitive to that, guys. We're sensitive to that. And if they need to stay home, praise the Lord. But what's the excuse of the rest of the lazy Christians? I'm not talking to you. You know that already. I'm not, and I'm not, if you're listening online today, I'm not trying to pick on you out there either. I'm talking about the church at large in America. I'm talking about the church at large in California. Don't stay home. If, you, if you're listening from California right now, there's a lot of people listening from California that actively go to regular churching and they have a church family in California and they're just not going because of all this COVID stuff. I want you to find a church, get on your websites and find a church that's open in your village, your city, your town in California and go to it and support that pastor. And so Rob told me, he said, yep, they fined us. They, they reduced the fine from $1,000 per occurrence to $500 per occurrence. 
And so they're, they were billed, uh, or they're, they're being fined $3,000, and I told them, we'll send the money. We're just going to send the money. So, yeah, you, now you can, see, now you didn't, you didn't clap as much for that, because you're thinking, oh, man, now he's going to ask us for money. And you're darn right I am. <laughs> now, here's what I want to do. I want to blow them away, you guys. I want to blow them away. Because I want them to see this from churches all over the country. Now, we, we'll, we don't have to send millions of dollars to them, but if you want to participate in that measly $3,000 gift, if more than that comes in, we'll send it. Just write church on your envelope or in the memo section, and that will go toward this. Because you know what? They're being fined right now. This is They've got another $1,000 worth of fines because they're meeting right this minute. Worshiping the Lord. And they're going to meet again. They have three services on Sunday morning now. Their, their church is, it, isn't even as big as ours. And, but, so they've got people meeting in three services. They've got an overflow area. They've got people in the cars. They bought a little FM radio station so they can have people out in the cars in their parking lot so that people can listen. Is Mark Zerflew here in the, in the room, by the way? I, think, I thought I saw him in the first service. Or one of the, are, you, are you here, Mark? All right, we want the FM station here. We want to do it. So you, you people drive by randomly, they're going to just happen to hear what's going on in this building. I want to put on the marquee. Listen right now, FM 92.5 or whatever it is. Scare them to death. <laughs> Teach them there's people in here that love them and they should come in here. Amen? Amen. So I'm, I'm a little upset today, by the way. You can tell. And so... The thing is, is that uh, we want to help them with that. We want to say we love you. We care about you. And we pray for them. They're not the only church. There's other churches. But here's a small church. where He had to resign his position as mayor of their city so he could disobey their rules. Praise the Lord for him. We need heroes like that. Randy Stonehill wrote a song years ago. Burn decided for me yesterday. We're sitting on the back porch. And she said, Rest assured, when Jesus comes again, he'll be looking for some angry young men. And I'll tell you, that's the truth. We need people that are, take a stand. And take a stand for the truth. Well, and that leads me to something else. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just in a mood today. I'm just going to get it all out. And maybe next Sunday we'll have a better Sunday. I'm a little upset with some Christians right now because I think Christians are getting too focused on political candidates and, and fights and, and, and being condescending and everything, and I don't want it anymore. I don't want that. I, I do want you to stand for the truth. I want you to vote. I want every one of you to vote. I'm going to talk about something you need to call your legislators about today. I need you to know this. But let, let me tell you something. If, if you're here today and you're visiting and you don't want to be offended, leave now because I'm about to offend you. You cannot be a Christian and be a Democrat. I'm just, look, look just don't applaud, don't apply. listen to me, don't applaud. I don't want you to applaud this because I'm not, I'm not happy about this. I'm not, this isn't a political campaign. I'm just telling you, look, you, you might be a Democrat and get saved, but if you, after you got saved, you start learning the word of God. You have to change your worldview because the democratic platform, I'm not talking about Joe Biden. And I'm not talking about Donald Trump. This is no campaign. I'm talking about what Christians stand for. I, mean, I couldn't help but think about the, the, just one issue, abortion. If you are a Democrat, your, your whole party stands for the right to kill your child. And if you are on a Republican platform, or independent in some cases, but in Republican platform, you stand on a pro-life platform. Now, I will tell you right now, I'm very frustrated that our so-called Republican, so-called conservatives are just sissies when it comes to abortion. We are pathetic. This needs to stop. But at the other end of the spectrum, you cannot call yourself a Christian and, and, and say, I believe in all this liberalism and no borders and, and all the, the wacky stuff that's going on out there. God is the one that established borders in the nations. Remember, God is the one that confused the languages of the people and separated them at the Tower of Babel. We're, we're heading back to Babylon. 
And so I'm frustrated, but I don't want people, I, listen, you guys, I don't want to hear people going off on their little tangents and being mean and condescending about their political stuff. You, if somebody wants to talk politics to you, just ask them about abortion. Just go right there. Don't even talk to them about economics and whether Trump will make you rich. I don't care if you're rich. God doesn't care if you're rich. Jesus told people, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Okay, uh, there's context there. I'm not going to develop all that. But I'll tell you right now, you, if somebody wants to talk to you about, well, we're, we think Biden will do a better job. Say, I want to talk to you about abortion. Do you believe it's right for a woman to be able to kill her own unborn child? Just one of our young gals just had a baby today. That you can applaud for. She didn't choose to end the life of her child. She chose life. Life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, we, we talk about all that stuff. I, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm going to teach the Bible sometime. <laughs> but I'm, I'm upset about all this. Because I don't want to hear about that anymore. I want to hear about Jesus. I want, I want people to be warned of the wrath to come. You think that a nation that continues to kill its babies is going to escape the wrath? COVID ain't nothing. I'm talking about fire falling from the sky. I'm talking about earthquakes unlike anything we've ever seen before. I'm talking about lakes and rivers and streams being turned to blood. I'm talking about boils all over people's bodies. And for all this, they curse God. They don't turn their hearts to the Lord in repentance. They continue in their rebellion. We need to be telling people about that. There's a judgment coming. And if we care about them, we're not going to fight about who's going to make you more money. We need to tell people there, there's a God that loves you. The tiddlywink Jesus. No, we're talking about the God of judgment. This is, these are troubling times. 62,000 people were killed in Nigeria for their faith. We didn't stop the world for that. We should stop the world for that. That was one little country. Find me one country in the entire world that had 62,000 people die of COVID this year. 62,000 Christians were slaughtered. You think God's turning his cheek? No. He's filling up the, the bulls of wrath. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We need to call this nation to repentance. We need to call the church to repentance. Getting back to the word and getting back to prayer and getting back to worship and being sober about our times. My heart breaks about this stuff, you guys. I don't want to hear about Democrat, Republican. We, we have a stewardship. You know me. I, I get engaged. I, I, I'm, I'm excited about the fact that we need to vote against the evils of this world. I don't even know how I, I can vote for certain things. You know, I love President Trump half the time. I'm serious. Sometimes he makes me so mad I want him to shut his mouth. You know, he's our president, though, and I'll support him. But look, uh, my vote is to defend biblical worldview. Biblical worldview. That has to be why we vote. It's not about your money. God wants us to be good stewards of our money, too, by the way. But, but look, we've got so much to deal with. The Democratic platform is all about gay marriage. You guys think BLM is about black lives? It's not. No Christian is a racist, by the way. Let me just tell you something right now. I'm an, oh, man, I am mad today. I am, I am sorry. I am telling you the truth. You call yourself a Christian and you're a racist, you need to repent. There is no excuse for that. But that's not what BLM is about. You know how many pastors are out there putting on their BLM t-shirts and, and telling everybody we have systemic racism? Come on. Wait a minute, I think Biden said that. Come on, man. Come on. 
Black Lives Matter. Go to their website. Read it for yourself. It's all about the LGBTQ community and embracing transgenderism. Pedophilia, Brenda points out too. Yes. Come on, you guys. And come on, pastors. Don't be sissies. We got to stand up and tell the truth. Antifa. Whatever. <laughs> you know? That's just, you might as well just rename it anarchy. We just want anarchy. You can't get COVID if you're burning down a city. But you sure as heck can get COVID going to church. And I will say this right now. And you know what? God knows what he's doing. He, he can do whatever he wants. You know? And if he wants everybody in this room to get COVID, then he'll let everybody in this room get COVID. But I'll tell you something else. Since we reopened, and it, we, we, we reopened exactly when I felt like the Lord wanted us to, not one person has got COVID in this building. Not one. Now, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that in boasting. Because, you know, if, if that happens, we will be concerned about that. We're taking precautions. We want to keep you healthy. And like I said, if you're weak or sick, stay home. But man, what is happening? We got to take a stand. It's, this is no time for tiddlywink Jesus anymore. That, that little soft, mushy God in the sky. There's a God of judgment. All right. Now back to our announcements. <laughs> Here's a couple of things you need to know. Otherwise, political things. Um, our tomorrow, our uh, the governor called that our legislators back into session, inappropriately. He's not giving them uh, the freedoms that they should be exercising, but he's given them some standards by which that they are going to function and, and they're going to be allowed to hear and vote on only certain things that he has predetermined. And in the shortest version possible, this is just another government overreach where they're going to be able to control everything. They're going to be able to continue this emergency standard. You can do the, whatever the heck we want to do, we can do. And you, I'm going to tell you right now, we the people, by the people, for the people, if we don't do what the people are supposed to do, the people that are going to take advantage of the other people that are not doing, and those that are looking forward to this kind of government overreach are going to get their way if we don't do what we're supposed to do. And we need to repent of not voting. Repent of not calling. A repent of not standing. Because people are going to hurt by this stuff. Pretty soon they're going to tell you, you can't go come into our shopping center unless you're vaccinated. Don't get me started on vaccinations. <laughs> telling you right now, man. Do you know that they use live baby tissue? To, in the development of vaccinations, many vaccinations, not all, not all. Don't, don't, I don't want to miss, have you misunderstand that. But you know, you, you need to know what's going on out there. This, we're living in wickedness. This is demonic. We got to wake up. And so you call your legislators and tell them, don't you dare vote yes. Don't you dare let the governor get away with this. He's out of control. It's just wrong. And when we, when we do have this kind of a government that is by the people and for the people, we are the ones that are supposed to take re responsibility. And therefore, it is our responsibility. And if we don't do it, then we're accountable. Okay? All right. I, I, I'm telling you, I'm sorry, you guys. I, I need to teach the Bible. I've got only about 10 minutes left. I was just going to quote John 3.16. I just didn't go, oh, look, there it is. It's a Bible verse. Look, let me just run you through a few quick verses, a couple things here. we got about eight or ten minutes left. And we'll go there because I don't want to fail to honor the Lord by opening the word with you. So Romans chapter 9. This is part three. Romans chapter 9, part three. And while you're turning your Bibles, I'm just going to do the first five verses very quickly. 
We've covered them before, but I want to dig down in a couple of areas. We're now at that point where we're going to go through the, the, the chapters exegetically. We're going to teach the verses one by one by one, and we're going to deal with this material. Okay, And so uh, Paul is talking to the Romans. It's a Jew-Gentile mixture that's in the audience. He's communicating to them that God has not forsaken Israel. He says, I tell the truth in Christ, I'm not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. So he's talking about his family, his country, his people. And guys, I want to point out something to you. We're reading the Bible, okay? And he's talking about Israel. Last night, I was sitting on the porch smoking my pipe. And, I'm, and I'm, as I'm sitting there, I'm looking at my phone, and all of a sudden I get a memo that says, Facebook, uh, you've got a bunch of messages on your Candlelight Facebook uh, page. And so I quickly look at it, and I'm, I just read. I'm just going to say this very quickly. I read through 30 or 40 just people ripping us to shreds because yesterday in our parking lot, there was a Republican Central Committee meeting. And there was flags out there and hot dogs for the kids and we're giving away snow cones. Oh, how terrible, you people, giving away free snow cones to kids. <laughs> Trying to indoctrinate them with the evils of being a Republican. It wasn't even our event. They just used our parking lot. But, they, but, but they, then I was reading through it and they were talking about the fact that we have an Israeli flag in our church. And I'm thinking, oh, you've been in our church. Now you're accountable. See, and they're going, they have no idea. And you guys, do you have any, any idea how many people don't understand that we're talking about Jesus, a Jew, Messiah, a, from a book that's a Jewish book about Israel? That's what this is. Man, are we that illiterate? He's, I hope not. And so he's talking to these Romans and he's answering the same question that every Bible teaching church ought to know. Has God forsaken Israel? The answer is no. We haven't replaced Israel. He's, Paul is pouring out his life. He says, I would give up my own life if it were possible so that I could save the Jews. And then he develops. He says, look, the Israelites, it, to them, it, these things pertain to the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Now, look, we've, we've read these verses already in the introduction of the introduction to the introduction, obviously, but let me just break down a couple things for you. The adoption, of course, we've talked about that already extensively, because Paul does. But he even says of Israel, God says to Pharaoh, and he's going to get to Pharaoh in a few minutes. He says, Israel is my own son. He's adopted them as his own son. This is his promised people and a promised land and a covenant people. There you go for, he goes into the glory and the covenants. Now the glory we've covered because we're talking about the ultimate sanctification process that every believer is going to have. The promises of the ultimate salvation, the, the climactic salvation God made to Israel, they forfeited Gentiles today, by God's grace, are responding to. Too many people are still forfeiting it. And I want to tell you something right now. I don't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile. You can't escape the wrath to come. God's not holding anybody out. God is saying, come, you who are thirsty and heavy laden, weary. I will mend you. I will heal you. I will build you up. I will protect you from the wrath to come. Just come unto me. We need to tell people that. These are the promises, and he says this to Israel. The covenants. Now, there are several covenants in the Bible. There, I think there's eight. Now, some would like to suggest there's seven. I'm okay with that. Seven is the number of completeness. Eight's the number of new beginnings. The, the eighth is the new covenant, which is a new beginning. It fits better in my model. But let me just walk you through them. We don't have time to go through all these, but I'll just tell you this. The Edenic covenant, the Eden, in Eden. It, the Adamic covenant, what happened with Adam, the covenant God made with Adam after the fall. The, the Noahic covenant, when God made a promise. And by the way, I'm still mad, so I'm going to keep on being mad for a minute. I don't want the homosexual stealing the rainbow. Look, 
the Noahic covenant, I'm telling you the truth. Because look, think about how demonic that is. Think about how sick that is. God used the rainbow to prove to the rest of the world that he will never again judge the world by a global flood. It's a promise that I'm not going to judge the world by a global flood. He has not promised not to judge the world. He just, he, he flooded the entire earth. And all of our public schools and our institutions of learning, all of them deny a global flood. All of them deny the fact that God judged the world in those days. I'm telling you right now, be here next Sunday. Russ Miller's going to tell you why you can prove that God did in fact do that. Every time I look up in the sky and I see a, a rainbow, I think, praise the Lord. I'm not talking about people that are struggling. I'm talking about these rebellious, wicked, evil sodomites. And they are evil. And they're going right after the promise of God and spitting in his face and saying, we're going to take the rainbow and make it our symbol. No, you're not. And I'm not lacking compassion for the gay community, you guys. I know people that are struggling. I care about them too. I care about them. We love them. We'll tell them the truth in love. But there is an agenda out there with this Black Lives Matter, this Antifa, this LGBTQ. Man, these people are filled with the devil. And they are working against us. It's time for us to wake up. I told you I was still mad. I don't, don't, don't. All right, thank you, but don't. This isn't a rally against people, you guys. I'm passionate about this because I care about people. I care about you, the saints of God, of course, but I care about them too. And I, I'm, I'm opposed to the way people have treated people. But right now, all the tables are getting turned to make us feel like we're the bad people. No, we're the rescuers. We're the guys that build the hospitals. We're the guys with the benevolence ministries. We're the guys raising money at doing 5Ks to help the working poor. We care about people. I've never had a homosexual come into this building that I didn't embrace. I mean physically embrace. I'm a hugger. You guys know that. I don't, I'm not afraid. I'll minister to them and pray with them and love them. And tell them the truth. But then there's this element. These wicked, wicked men. And women. You're not taking away the promises of God. You're not taking away the glory. The covenant. Abraham's covenant. Um, Mosaic covenant. The giving of the law. The, the uh, Davidic covenant. The promise of a Messiah. And the, the new covenant. And Jesus gave us the new covenant. You, you want to talk about persecution and wickedness. I read this last week that somebody had, viewing what we do in our church, had said that when we take communion, we're teaching our, communi our, our Christians in this church to engage in cannibalism because we're teaching them to drink blood and to eat flesh by taking communion. They have no idea what they're talking about, but that's persecution. That's the devil. That's demons. And that's about your church, you guys. Your church. But Christ came, verse 5, to Israel, for Israel, by Israel, to redeem Israel. And we, we get the blessings just the same. Okay? So verse 5, Christ came who is overall the eternally blessed God. Amen. Jesus is the eternally blessed God. The God. The only God. So I don't believe that. Well, take it up with him. And, and look, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not. I'm not trying to be mean. But you know what? Maybe our little softy, little peddly gospel, we need to firm up a little. Because we need people to understand, look, Jesus does love you, but Jesus also is a God of judgment. He is the God. And there is sin in the world, and people are guilty of sin, and Jesus Christ came According to the flesh, he's talking about his natural birth. He was a Jew. We, we can talk about the virgin birth another time, but he, he came according to the flesh, the eternally blessed God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, to redeem mankind unto himself and to spare us the indignity of all this horrible stuff that's happening in all, in all over the world. P people get mad at God. If there's a good God, then why do people suffer? Um, the, the problem is wrong. The onus is on the wrong person. 
The reason we suffer is because of us. The reason we suffer is because of sin, because of rebellion. And Jesus came to deliver us from our sin. He came to deliver us from our rebellion and change our hearts. God loves you. God loves everyone around us. He wants men to be saved. And he's, he's so longing. The reason, we quoted from Peter the other day, God is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, uh, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. Why did Peter even say that? Because people were saying, where's the promise of his coming? All things continue as they were. Blah, blah, blah. They're mockers. They're, 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 they're blind leaders of the blind. And Peter says, look, God's just being patient. He's letting you have time to repent. So you can turn to him and, from your unbelief to belief and say, Jesus, just save me. And, and guys, it's not about you. It's all about him. It's all about him saving you in spite of you. It's not because you're going to be good or ever gooder or better or good enough or better enough. It's because he was good. And he knows what wretched sinners we are. We are dust. He remembers our frame that we are dust. We are bags of dirt. Little water mixed in. <laughs> and he said, I came to save you, and to seek and to save that which was lost, the house of Israel. And the Jew goes to the gospel, goes to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. That's you and me, most of us. And I'm glad. If you're here today and you haven't said, I want to be one of his. I want to be adopted. The covenants, the promises, the blessings, the adoption, all given to Israel, they can be yours too. Grafted in to say, Lord Jesus, adopt me. You don't have to pray a prayer in a certain way. You don't have to formulate it in a certain way. No one's going to judge the way you pray. God, here's your heart. If you're listening today and you're thinking, man, that guy is mean. I want you to know something. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not. I am, I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm frustrated, I, I admit it. I, I'm sorry it, to demonstrate that anger the way I am, but at the same time, I have a righteous anger. I'm, I, I believe sometimes we're commanded to be angry and sin not. And it's time for the angry young men and women to stand up the right way. Not, don't be a jerk, don't be mean, don't be like me. <laughs> but love people, tell the truth. Next time somebody wants to get you engaged in the political process, say, you know what, can, can we talk instead, can we just talk about abortion? See what they say. Just try it. See what happens. There's so many things that we could talk about in our biblical worldviews. Anyway, I'm sorry. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, come. Come unto him. He will abundantly pardon and give you the riches and the wealth of the eternal. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. amen. Father, thank you for this time. Send us forth today in your grace and peace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.